So I guess this is what you might call, is, am I on? You're on. I guess this is what, what you might call show and tell. These are a couple of my constant companions during the war. Uh, of course, my M1 rifle and my helmet. Uh, I got to tell you about my helmet. Uh, this helmet is protection. We had to wear it virtually all the time when you were in any kind of a combat zone or on combat patrol or anything else. And so you had to wear it virtually the entire time. And the odd thing is that after the war, of course, I couldn't, you can't bring any of the, uh, the M1 rifle uh, uh, or the helmet. I got these on the open market and, or from, uh, from a gun shop, and I bought it on my own. But the odd thing is that today in Burr Ridge, I have to wear my helmet here when I go out into my own backyard. You know why? Why? Woodpeckers. <laughs> uh, but this M1 rifle, uh, uh, you, I can't bring it with the uh, loaded or any kind of materials, but it holds a clip. Uh, this clip holds eight bullets, and that's what you put in here. As soon as you finish your, you can fire this M1 rifle as fast as you can pull the trigger. It's semi-automatic. And as soon as your uh, eight, the last one is shot, uh, uh, shot, the clip flips out and you can push another clip in. So your firepower is much better than the Japanese rifle. I was able to send a couple of these home after the war. All I did was pack it up in the crate and mail it home. And uh, this is before uh, they, uh, they were decimating the Second Amendment. And uh, you could send it home. And I sent a couple of these Japanese rifles. I also a couple bayonets, which never made it home for some reason or other, but the rifles did. Uh, the sighting is much more delicate and accurate in the American rifle than it does in the Japanese. So we had a s superior piece of equipment. Uh, it's, uh, this is the sight, uh, and it is nearly as accurate as this little device here, which you can get windage back and forth and elevation adjustments very accurately on this, much more so than this. It is a higher caliber also and the firepower, they had to put each bullet in here individually, and then it was, it was bolt action. And so you could shoot much faster. Uh, the first shot, of course, is is the important one, but any additional shots after that, this is much superior because you didn't have to 
uh, use the bolt. You could just as soon as, as soon as you uh, you could pull the trigger, and it it shot, and you didn't have to. The 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 shell was ejected. So we did have a superior rifle. Uh, this is the bayonet that we took training in, uh, uh, close combat training, and it is used in the First World War uh, for trench warfare, but uh, uh, it was hardly ever, ever used because you never let anybody get close enough. And if you, if you did, it, if they were so close it, that they could, uh, uh, it'd be more efficient in your hand than at the end of a gun. Uh, This is a Japanese battle flag. Each of the Japanese soldiers were issued one of these flags. And uh, all these here markings here are uh, uh, they would get the autographs, or you might say, of each of their uh, of each of their the people that were in their unit, and they all signed each other's flag, and they'd take this into battle with them. And uh, lucky I got this instead of they get my rifle. And everybody always had to wear dog tags. You know what a dog tag is. And this isn't the original. I don't have my original. The original has a little notch or groove right in this position here. And what you do, the reason for the dog tags is if a person gets killed or injured or killed, uh, it's identification. They, they open the mouth and this notch hooks in, one of the, in the teeth. And they just put that dog tag in their mouth like that and the, uh, the teeth hold it and they take the other one to headquarters and uh, that's identification in case in case somebody gets killed the information on it has your army serial number and your name and your blood type and uh, this little device we always had along with our dog tags very important in the k rations that we had the k rations are like a little cracker jack box uh, you know what kind of cracker jack box i'm talking about the little uh, about so by so by so and it contains a can of, uh, uh, it looks like a tuna fish can. And you need a can opener. This is a can opener, believe it or not. Very efficient and long lasting, a good can opener. And that we have on our dog tags, so we don't lose it. 
and we always have it with us because that's necessary to open these cans that come in the K ration and that can virtually all the I don't know what else they had in them but virtually every can had one of two things it had a can full of American cheese or some kind of scrambled eggs. It looked like scrambled eggs. It was eggs. And that's the diet we were on for about nine months straight. Much different than sea rations. But uh, all that was in there was that can plus some uh, little, look, look, look like little crackers about a package so by so by so and uh, and also it had a either a tropical fruit or a tropical chocolate uh, tropical chocolate as compared to say a good tasting Hershey bar uh, and a little packet that had some uh, generally tea or something like that or some kind of a uh, uh, a a um, uh, condensed dried uh, uh, something that you put in with a cup of water and to make a drink out of. Uh, sometimes I think they had coffee but I, I have seldom saw the coffee in there. It was like a lemon drink. Uh, And this is something else that we had our training with. Uh, contrary to uh, the impressions that you get from watching movies, you see uh, the hero taking this and taking this pin, putting it in his mouth and pulling it and throwing the grenade. That's a bunch of bunk. Nobody they would end up having a dental bill if they ever did that. This is intended for f pulling out with a finger and our training and uh, almost all people in the infantry uh, uh, do okay but they start out with dummy grenades like this is, it wasn't a dummy grenade until it was disarmed and defused. I couldn't bring this into a school or, or any place else if it wasn't disarmed or defused, the same as my rifles. No live ammunition or nothing explosive uh, comes with them. Uh, but when you pull this pin, we're trained, this handle flips up and you've got five seconds before it explodes. There's a timing device that you're given five seconds once this handle flips over and it, it ignites the fuse. And you're trained, if you're in a, in a, a tre some trench or dugout or something like that and somebody else is in another one uh, or something very close, you're trained to pull the pin, count a thousand one, a thousand two, and possibly a thousand three if they're very close. After you pull this pin, and then throw it because if you if you pull the pin and throw it right away they've got 
about three seconds to throw it back. So depending on how far you away you are from, from you might say the victim, it depends on how far <laughs> and uh, you have to keep your wits with your two. There was one guy in our training, he got through the, uh, the dummy part of it and we, when we took our training for the live grenade, he pulled the pin and somehow he lost his wits or froze and he just dropped it right by his feet. And luckily the non-com grabbed it before the five seconds was over and threw it out for him. But that was the end of him in the, middle, in the infantry. Uh, I don't know where he was sent or what they did. They probably made a truck driver or, or something else out of him. So, uh, this canteen was always with us also. Uh, this hooked onto your belt and there was no place in our patrols for say a week or 10 days or two weeks or however long it took. There was no place to get water, no fountain or anything or place to go and buy some any water or uh, and no faucets, no uh, no nothing except where you could fill it up from the stream or lake or a pond or whatever. And you fill this up as you were going on patrol. Whenever you, whenever you were on a patrol, say a week's patrol, uh, you had to try and keep this as full as you could from one place to another, from one water hole or another. And uh, the, as far as purification of the water, uh, uh, whether it was contaminated or not, uh, you wouldn't drink water out of the uh, downstream from uh, rivers even here. But you'd fill up your canteen and you always had a bottle of what they called Halazone. Halazone was a water purifier. And you put one of those little tablets, it come in a bottle of 100, uh, you put one of those little tablets in the water and you let it set a little while to purify uh, decon you might say decontaminate or purify the water and then you drank it but you didn't you weren't supposed to uh, whenever possible you weren't supposed to drink from a stream or anything else because uh, uh, you could get uh, some kind of bugs and dysentery or diarrhea or something like that and as far as the South Pacific too. There was another thing that we uh, we had to take something called Atterbrun because it virtually all the natives in the Philippines had malaria and Atterbrun uh, was a substitute for quinine. The, the Japanese had all the uh, islands that produced the quinine. So we had a substitute called Atabrun. It was actually a dye. Uh, you could tell the people that had been over there uh, for a couple of years because they're, they're actually from this dye, even their eyes, the whites of their eyes, were 
show a yellow. Many people would it would show yellow until uh, until after the war when they stopped taking it. Uh, then they went back to normal. But during the time they were taking this adamant, their skin and their eyes would turn this yellowish color because uh, the adamant was actually used as a dye. And it also had the, uh, the properties to uh, allay the symptoms of malaria. So that's another thing that we had to take every day. And they also, because of the heat and humidity and the lack of uh, food that contains sodium, uh, 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 people can have either too much or too little sodium. Uh, you learn that in medicine and nursing and pharmacy. Uh, but because every, you could, because when you sweat, all the salt and sodium is depleted. And if you don't have enough of an intake, you get what they used to call heat fag at the time. So a lot of times why well, you had to take extra salt tablets and uh, as far as the medications that you had to take. But uh, other than that, would there be any questions that you'd have? Uh, after the war, uh, I uh, belong to the uh, VFW. I'm a past commander in that, and I'm a past commander in the uh, and presently uh, district historian. That's the reason for the white top here. And I'm a past commander, they call it Grand Chef or Chef de Gare. Uh, it's a title conferred instead of the commander in the 40 and 8. And uh, this is a, they have different colored hats. Uh, I happen to be uh, a present state director of youth sports, state photographer, and state historian. So I'm entitled to wear the white hat instead of the, uh, the uh, gray hat. Uh, other than that, uh, my father was the First World War and this is Sons of the American Legion. He enrolled me under the Sons of the American Legion about 80 years ago. And this, I still have the old cap. And this is about 80, somewhere between 80 and 85 years old. When, I, when he enrolled, enrolled us into the SAL. Uh, other than that, I thank you very much. Uh, here's a book that they issued us also, The Jap Soldier. And uh, it tells about the soldiers and, and the J Japanese soldiers and things like that. But um, that's about it. Okay. So. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.